Okay, so the recording has started, and I would like to welcome uh, everybody again on this online meetup for the combined uh, network. And today we'll uh, see, uh, or I will show you a tool how to do uh, polyglot data science. Well, not just data science, science in general, or programming in general using multiple uh, languages. For this, uh, I will be using a Jupyter uh, notebook inside the Jupyter Lab uh, environment, which is the, for those who are not uh, really familiar with it, it's the newer version of the Jupyter notebook. It's a much better designed um, interface, and it really looks like an IDE um, once you start it. And it's um, extendable. There are a lot of plugins. You can write your own if you want to. and um, well, it's a really nice tool. For this whole presentation, I will be using a, a project of my own, which is called the Data Hub Project. And well, you're using already the uh, URL uh, or subdomain, which I have set up specifically for this meeting. And we will use the project itself, uh, which you can see. This is the login screen. Um, I will log in with my user. Um, if you want to use it, this anytime, it's uh, well, it's public, um, you can use it if you want to. There's a fairly thin infrastructure underneath it right now. Uh, it's usually uh, three uh, small servers uh, with load balancing uh, between them. Uh, with each of them have two gigabytes of RAM and a single core uh, CPU at the moment, but I'm planning to um, scale it up uh, in the future and uh, maybe even move to Kubernetes when it arises. So uh, I will just uh, log in. This is, by the way, a Jupyter Hub, which is uh, uh, boxing or around the Jupyter Lab. And it, uh, it serves the purpose that multiple users can use the same environment with authentication and stuff. And if I log in, uh, I will get a Docker instance um, a Jupyter Lab in, uh, instance inside a Docker container. So, yes, uh, this is how it looks like. It's a uh, standard uh, Jupyter Lab environment. You can see that I have multiple kernels installed already um, with different languages, and there's an um, extension on my own that I'm writing. It's called EMBL Tools, which is the European uh, Bioinformatics. Uh, uh, so web services or tools. Um, they provide an API for the web services and I have some extension to utilize them um, without leaving the Jupyter lab, but that's not the topic here I want to talk about. So inside this uh, Docker uh, container, we have uh, some predefined folders. Um, the, the Docker containers offer um, persistence in these um, folders. Anything else, anything else outside in uh, these folders are volatile, so they will not be uh, kept once you log out. They will be lost because uh, the Jupyter Hub is right now configured to um, destroy the containers uh, once you log out. But if you save your stuff in the private folder, that will be saved and kept. Uh, even as new images come, so that's persistent. You can also share your stuff if you want to. If you uh, anything you put here in the public folder will be visible in for others in the shared folder, but only uh, readable, so not writable. So if you want to use somebody else's uh, work, you have to make a copy of it to avoid uh, conflicting on each other's work. That's just a short introduction to the project and environment we'll be using. And um, now I will have to open this, this one. So what we will be using is called this SOS kernel, which is uh, a funny acronym. It's not Save Our Souls. It's a script of, script of scripts. And it's an open source project by somebody else. And uh, I'm utilizing it. In, it's, it was mainly made for bioinformatics stuff, but it is also extensible. And um, well, I've decided to uh, install it here and extend it. 
And um, it's basically a kernel on its own. And um, oh, let me start the notebook. So it's a sort of a super kernel. And how it works is that it shows up as a, a unique kernel inside Jupyter. But for each cell, you can design, you can see it in the right side. For each cell, you can define what kind of subkernel you want to use. And how it works is that you have to have the native kernels underneath. So what the, this SOS kernel uh, does, it, it provides so-called language modules, which execute the statements you put in the cells in the native kernel and then returns with their output. So without Java, Julia, or R, or even Python not being installed in the system, the SOS would not work with these languages. And you also have to have a special uh, module for it, uh, called so-called language module installed for it, uh, that this uh, SOS kernel loads and learns about the language that it can support. So um, by default, by the authors of this uh, SOS kernel, they provide um, support for multiple languages, including Python and Julia and R by default, and uh, even to MATLAB and Octave uh, kernels. So people with uh, those uh, scripts in those uh, languages could also use it. Um, I decided to make a new language kernel for Java. There, uh, there was already an existing one, but it didn't really fit the needs uh, I wanted it uh, to work like. So I basically wrote from, from, from scratch. Everything you see here is um, under development. Uh, everything is open source. Um, you, can, um, you can find it on GitHub, as I'll show at the end of the presentation. And yeah. You can you can contribute if you want to and like to. So this is uh, this will be uh, a more of a technical presentation a little bit. So uh, showing you how it works and what it is capable of. And in the end of the at the end of the presentation, I will uh, show it with a real more real like example uh, quickly. So as I said, we have. Uh, multiple languages here, and for each of them, you can select each of the cells, you can select which kernel you want. And right now, it's Java, and it's Java 11. And as you may know, uh, since Java 9, uh, a REPL uh, tool was added to Java officially, so it can be used from uh, terminal as a as like a Python console. It, it's called JShell. And this is what is this is built upon, basically. So it uses Java 9 plus, currently 11 in this installation, and the so-called iJava kernel underneath. And if I am uh, to I am to execute this cell, well, sometimes it takes uh, a while to spin it up, but then it just prints the stuff. So this is really basic. Uh, I have a hash map. That's not too difficult, and some string, uh, strings and integers. Um, there's one thing. If you want to use um, non-primitive types like, uh, or, or composite types, or collections, like hash, hash map, it's best to not to initialize them in a single line, because that can interfere with the data transfer to other kernels. It will work in the single Java kernel, but when you try to pass it on to another kernel, it would most likely fail. It's best to have it uh, like this, that you that you have an empty hash map or set or whatever, and then put um, elements into it. So this is not nothing big so far. And um, in the next cell, you see I'm using a Python 3 um, kernel. And the SOS uh, kernel supports some um, special magics <clears throat> which with you can transfer data between kernels and how it works is it essentially creates a, a distinct unique instance of the variable you are transferring in the target kernel and assigns the same value to it so okay if i execute this here 
yeah, it prints the same thing while in Python the keys uh, for a dict, uh, sorry, it's a map. Yeah, in uh, Python it's a dict. It's different sy uh, syntax instead of an equal sign, you have a column, but the content is the same. But right now I have a map in Java and a dict in Python, which are have right now the same values because it's it's copied. So, but the the variables are not linked; they are not synchronized automatically. They are two different instances with the same content. So, if I am to add a third, sorry, a third key. And then, oops. So third, Ooh, my typing is so bad. Third. I'm used to the other. Ah, okay, so third, and I will execute it. Okay, I will. Well, I'll just oops, make a new cell. And if I am to print it again, yeah. So you see, I have here an extra key, and here I don't have it. Unless I execute this again, so uh, unless I make the get again, they are not synchronized. So we have some uh, primitive types that can go back and forth, like. Um, a Python dictionary can be um, moved back to um, Java, and you will have it. And I have added something called as. It's an extra parameter that is not uh, in the official or the original project. I, this is something that I added to it. And as currently the, on, uh, the only format that is supported by this parameter is JSON. So if I enter it, it you will get a JSON. Um, in Java, or let's step back one uh, step. In general, the this parameter um, depends on the underlying language, and the in, inside that language, the underlying library that handles JSON conversion. So in Java, it's it's based on this uh, Jackson object mapper, which is a I find a very I find to be a very good uh, way to to convert uh, Java objects to JSON. But um, in Julia and R, there are lots of even in Java and Python, there are lots of other ways to convert something to JSON, and not everything can be converted to JSON. Um, the primitive stuff and the built-in types will most likely convert from one language to the other, but if you have custom classes types, um, it can happen that they won't convert to JSON because the underlying library may or may not support conversion of it. But uh, I find it, uh, but my goal is to, to have this as much extended as it can be so that if you cannot con, uh, convert uh, something natively you would still have the option to have json because it's a fairly widespread data format it's very simple it's text-based so and it's used on web of course so if you are doing something and you wanted to put it on the web using json is pretty much standard Okay, so now we're going to R, and um, again, I will just get the dictionary from uh, Python to R, and it just works. And R works with Java as well. So, as I said, the primitive stuff is working. Um, I've been experimenting today with, with JSON, and uh, especially in R, it was not really um, doing so well with, with custom classes. Um, as you see, I don't have Julia in this uh, notebook because Julia doesn't um, seem to be 
stable in this kind of environment, it tends to hang often. Um, and I couldn't find the reason for it so far, so uh, I decided to exclude it uh, from this tutorial or this uh, presentation because it may or may not have worked. Okay, so this is the basic way you can use this kernel. You can pass data around, um, and basically that's the whole central concept of it, that you, you pass data around. Um, but there are some extra stuff built in, so to say. Okay, well, there are some extra, it can be, okay, well, ah, oh, yeah, I forgot to execute this one. No. Okay. And um, this is where it gets interesting. This is not the only way to use the this kernel. You can have it like, okay, this is a string. And this is a string from Python, and you have to execute it. And okay, yeah, it's just proof of concept that the uh, data uh, passing works between it. And there is a special kernel called Markdown, which, it's, as its name suggests, it's made for uh, writing Markdown. But uh, the kernel supports uh, a very nice magic, which is hidden here. It's called expand. And if you have the markdown kernel and you say expand in Python 3, you can embed variables or, or code from Python and then it will be uh, rendered in markdown directly. So as you can see, I have this test variable here, which is defined up uh, somewhere here. Ah, oh, yes, here. So I can just uh, execute it. And you see, it has been replaced with the, the value of it. And uh, it, it can actually perform um, computation as well. So if I am to, let's say, it should be two, and I say the source should be test slash, should be more like test slash two. Okay. Uh, yes, it's not <laughs> working like this. Okay. Um, let's pull it up. Okay. It should support. Um, oh, yeah. I have to execute the <laughs> Python cell as well, otherwise, it's uh, not executed. Yep. You see, uh, so now it's it's a number. And the original source says test multiplied by two. So you can actually uh, make computations inside Markdown, which is very handy if you want to document your code and want to insert examples, you can just reference the code you already wrote. And when it gets executed, the values will be updated. Even if you update the code, you just we execute the markdown, markdown and it will be uh, updated as well, which is very, very, very handy. And you can also do it this with Java. So all these language modules you have should support by default this expand magic, otherwise it will not work. And I also added it to Java and then you see that this is the original values uh, from the top of the notebook with the Java hash map. Okay. And there's another way to use it uh, with this with magic. This is really handy if you don't really want to switch uh, using the drop down here. You can, you can leave the default SOS kernel, which is basically a Python kernel uh, in the background, and use the with magic to perform uh, computation, ah, I always forget to <laughs> execute this here. So you can perform computation in a target language with this with uh, magic. Oh, again, the language module itself has to support this, uh, otherwise it will not work. <clears throat> but R and Python and Julia should support out of the box and uh, I'm working on Java to make it support as well. 
And there's one added feature uh, I added to Java, which is uh, type safety or override protection. Depends how you want to call it. Since uh, Java is a uh, statically typed language, I figured that it may not be the best idea to just import or get variables um, from other languages um, that you don't know the type of. So let's assume we have, let's, uh, let's go to the bottom. Okay. Oops. So I will just open the uh, Java panel. And I, I just make a string, okay? String, oops, sorry. String Java, I'll just call it SDR. And it's not a good name. I'll just call it string then. And call it dummy. So that's typical, and I will execute this. Okay, I, now I have a variable called string with the content of dummy. And here I will make a Python kernel here and make another variable called string, but instead of actually assigning a string value to it, I will assign an integer to it. So in Python, I have a string that has an integer value of it. And now again, I have Java and I say, get string from item three and I will print it. It's the good old system dot out dot print fn and string. And the semicolon at the end. Yes. And it kept its value. And you can see the warning here that it's a feature I added that it checks if you have already a variable named like that. It doesn't matter if you create it in a kernel, in a cell, or it has been imported from before. If you have a variable that are with the same name, but the type doesn't match, it won't allow you to import it by that name. And it will give you a warning that this exists already with a different type, but it will still import it with a different name. So if I want to actually see the value of this variable, I will have to use this name because it has auto renamed it. I'm planning to implement this feature to oops, to other uh, languages currently supported in this uh, environment so that you can make sure whenever you do anything, you will not overwrite your values uh, of the same name unless you really want to, unless their types are uh, uh, matching. So if now I do the same, it will still give me the warning because I'm still importing the same variable. But now you see it um, prints, prints it under the new name. Okay, but this is the funny thing. If I am to uh, now string in Python, okay, let's execute this. Oops, and you see, if there are type, after the conversion match, then it will allow the assignment of the new uh, value. So you can still overwrite yourself, but at least it, you will not get a different type um, and you will not run into random errors and, and exceptions that your code or script uh, expects something, but uh, it gets a different type. And this is, this I find, uh, in particularly handy when you use scripts from the internet or from colleagues or from others and you might use the same name but different types and if you just execute it and, and, and you're not uh, careful or, or you don't uh, 
see that there is a, a conflict, you might just get random stuff and start have to start debugging and, and waste time on finding out what's going wrong uh, with a script that used to work. So um, this is basically the, the technical part um, of it. As I said, it's still under development and um, a lot of features are on the uh, plan to, to be added to all of the language modules and eventually um, uh, make them better and work. And uh, I have also prepared another notebook, uh, which is a little bit more like more real life. And in this, we will use Python 3 and uh, R um, for a very, very short demo. And in this data hub project, uh, BioPython is uh, already installed. So I could just import all these packages and it will have no issue. And well, <laughs> Since we are have a lockdown because of this virus, I uh, decided to use this uh, COVID um, genomic sequence from a, from a FASTA file, and I can just read it, and uh, I can calculate the GC content of it. It's a for those who are not really into bioinformatics or biology. This is uh, just one statistical parameter of the genome of this virus. That's Nothing fancy in it. But this demo here uh, tries to show a scenario where you, you just get a script from a colleague and he likes to work in Python. And you could just copy paste the script into the Python kernel and execute it, and it would work, assuming all the libraries and files it uses are there. But you prefer to work in R for some reason. You like it, you are more proficient in R, you, you have your own scripts. And a way to, back in the old, old days, what could you do? Well, you could communicate, so to say, mm, between the scripts using files. You dump the output of, of the first script in some file, you write some boilerplate code to read that file in another script and manipulate it. Or, or just in even in Jupyter kernel or using Jupyter, you could just have different notebooks open and switch between tabs and copy paste or do the same thing, read, read write files. But essentially, what you do is just transferring data from one script to the other, and this is where this super super kernel comes in handy because you can just pass the stuff around the and. The only stuff you need, you, I mean, you have to pass, uh, you can pass the, the small stuff you really need and, and ignore the others. You don't have to pause an entire object if you are just uh, interested in a few properties of it. So, uh, using the Python kernel, uh, I have um, calculated some so called moving average of the GC content here and I will import it into R and make a really basic plot of it. And there you have it. Um, yeah, it's just some, some debugging here even. So there you go. I mean, um, if I am to, if I were to uh, do this without this kernel, without this tool, I would have to, well, I could have written it the whole thing in R uh, myself, because R supports the same thing about these libraries, and R has a vast, vast library for bioinformatics and, uh, and all kinds of packages, so I could have done it pure R if I wanted to, but that's not the point here. And uh, of course, you can imagine more elaborate, elaborate uh, scenarios or more complex scenarios where you have, for example, legacy code uh, from, from Python something or maybe even from Java and then let's not forget that Java also has a uh, bio Java uh, bioinformatics uh, based uh, library so this allows you to to mix and match the, your favorite things together um, you could use uh, you could reverse the scenario and compute statistics and and all kinds of, of mathematical stuff you want to do in, in R, but you could use Bokeh in Python 
to plot it. I know Bokeh has uh, bindings for R, but there are other libraries that don't. Right? Or you could use Julia, for example, well, consider that it's, it's stable enough and working well. You could use Julia to, to uh, make the good plots and good visualizations. So um, that's about it, what I wanted to talk about. I know it was short, but um, I wanted to focus really on the, on the basics and give you, give you ideas. And uh, before um, going, uh, before ending the presentation, I just want to show you the uh, project's um, websites. And it's called, well, as the link says, it's called datahub.info. You can have, uh, you can see or, or read all the documentations, news announcements, roadmap, um, even related projects, uh, whatever you want, and uh, technical stuff. So you can check out all the features and specs. It's a bit outdated, so I have to update, but you can, you could uh, list or see the packages installed already. You can work with and the environment. Um, there's even a Docker hub, so you can download the exact image we, uh, I'm using. It's based on uh, the bio notebook base, that's all it's based upon, and there's a standalone version you can run locally on your computer um, using some Docker comments that, is, uh, that are uh, listed here. I would like to emphasize the one thing that uh, the standalone version offers no persistence at all. So you have to mount some local directories where you will work uh, unless, unless your work um, might disappear if you destroy the container. Well, as long as the container exists, even if it's shut down, it will keep the, your work, but once you destroy the container, it will be vanished into thin air. So, and we have a uh, GitHub where I store the um, Docker files and some uh, scripts. And there's one other thing I would like to show you where the uh, language models are listed. So I'm building a SOS kernel collection um, that are most of them are based on the original ones. You can see from the source um, that I have sub modules, and if you if you click on those, you can see which ones are, are fork and which ones are not. And this is the source uh, for this project. So I would like you uh, like to thank you for your attention, and this concludes the uh, video and presentation for this meetup. I will uh, stop the recording, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So again, thank you.